Dr. Adrian Hordick is going to present to us. I believe it's kind of a model for us, right? Uh, thank you. Uh, an example. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Hi, everyone. I'm Adrian Hordick. It's really great to be here with you today. It's one of my first times in you know, quite a while now. I've been hopped on a plane and gone to a room full of people. So it's really nice to be doing this in person. Um, I'm going to be giving a, an overview of the MSC process and using the Red Snapper and Gag Grouper as an example. And it's really I'm going to cover the same concepts and terminology that Tom spent the morning talking about. Um, so it's no new material here, but it's going to come from a slightly different angle and with a different accent. Hopefully, it makes things a little clearer uh, that are you know, still a little bit uncertain. So they've got two parts to my uh, talk. The first part is very quick. It's just to recap or go over the, the the difference between stock assessment and management strategy evaluation. I know Tom spent quite a bit of time talking about that this morning. We, we had a good discussion about it, um, so it'll be quite brief. But the reason doing that is because, for one, it's going to set the context of the rest of my talk, and secondly, because we found this is a really important concept that people understand when we go into MSC um, to, to, to realise that this is a different process than what we may be more familiar with, with a, a typical sort of stock assessment process. Uh, and then I'm going to move to an MSC process, uh, a demonstration of what the process could look like using the Red Snapper and the Gag Grouper um, as an example. And so these are my two objectives for this talk, is to demonstrate what this process could look like, just to give a, a straw man an example of what this process could look like we can start building upon, and to highlight the key issues or the, uh, the key questions. Uh, we've already talked about a bunch of them, um, just to revisit them, to things to think about, which we won't, we won't necessarily discuss them all today, but Throughout this process, there will be things that we spend a lot of time talking about. Before I get into that, but I just wanted to say I'm really excited to be working here on this fishery because I live up in Canada now, um, and the fishing there is like standing in a stream like this, which like it's fun. But like I'm from Australia, and we do fishing like proper fishing, like you guys do. So this is like my version or Australian version of catching red snapper and gag grouper. It's like a slightly chubbier version of me uh, fishing in, in Northwest Australia. And now to get, do something similar like that, we've got to go, it's a tom, photo of Tom there and uh, trolling in, in Mexico. So it's really great to be working in a, in a fishery where there's like you know, real fishing uh, energy. All right, contrasting stock assessment with management strategy evaluation. So for a stock assessment, the key questions are really, what is the current state of the stock, the historical state of the fish stock? How many fish are in the water? It's usually measured in biomass. Questions like, is the stock overexploited relative to some reference points? And should management regulations be changed? These are the questions, sorts of questions that a stock assessment is focused upon. And the output of the assessment process is an estimate of the key population parameters, the abundance, like how many fish are in the water, and the productivity, how, how uh, quickly that population can naturally respond or uh, increase if fishing pressure is reduced, for example. Uh, so this characterizes the actual population. And then another output of assessment is the current stock status relative to some reference points. Is the stock overexploited? And then those two pieces of information are used to provide advice to managers with short-term projections of population state subject to different harvest policies, like different TACs. So this is something you're all probably very familiar with. Uh, and this is the standard sort of stock assessment paradigm. And the process can look different in, in every place, but it generally follows a, a similar sort of uh, a process. You start with fishery data, come in from the different, uh, yeah, either fishery dependent or fishery independent uh, data comes in. That gets passed to a scientist to, you know, in a basement somewhere, put all the data into their model and do the assessment. And then the results come out and presented to a stakeholder group, uh, managers and, and other stakeholders to discuss and interpret. And then some action comes out of that. Um, if everything's straightforward, it's like a management action, often what happens in many cases is the assessments are uncertain or there's disagreements about the assessment or the interpretation of the assessment and so it's not clear what that action should be um, and in many cases it means no action is taken at all um, until until the next round or something like that and that was like Tom talked about this morning that was a this was the problem that led to the development of management strategy evaluation to try and get around this uh, roadblock that would end up at the end of an assessment process where Everybody in the room couldn't agree in the assessment and no one knew what to do. And that happened all over the world. Um, and MSC was developed out of that <clears throat> to solve that problem. 
So the management strategy evaluation approach to a different question. The key question here is what management policy, or sometimes it's called a management procedure or a management strategy, but what policy for managing the fishery is the most appropriate for this fishery? And so ask questions like what process should be used to convert this our fishery data into management advice? Is this process robust to uncertainty? And, and ask answers questions like under what conditions is our management policy likely to fail? When does it start? If it works, it's working well now, what are the situations where it's likely to start to become problematic? And so the output of an MSC is a, a reproducible and transparent process for selecting a management plan. So we've selected, we've come up with this management plan for these reasons. We want to achieve these things. We believe this about our fishery and therefore we're going to do these actions. It's an agreed process. The management plan's agreed up front. At the end of an MSC process, you've got an, an agreed process of going from data to management advice. And like I mentioned, it identifies the conditions where that management plan is likely to work and where it's likely to fail or where it's likely to require revision. So it, it's a lot of work up front, but it tries to answer all those questions so that you can focus on the, the things that really matter. And so I'm going to go through the, uh, the process for an, an MSC, what this can look like and contrast that with the stock assessment. It starts with the same, what we've already heard, it starts with the fishery data. It always starts with the same, what is the same data coming from the fishery. But what's different is what gets done with that data. Instead of going into one assessment model, uh, the data gets used to develop operating models like Tom's work around. And this is the stakeholders develop different models, different hypotheses about the, the dynamics of the fishery. From there, we also develop management policies or management procedures. Again, like Tom talked about this morning, a stakeholder group like this can develop different proposals for different ways to manage the fishery. We call them MPs, MP1, MP2, they can have names. Um, and, and, and the group develops a whole, a whole list of potential methods that are called candidate approaches for, fit, for management. Once we've got those two pieces of information, the models and the management procedures, they go into the closed loop evaluation which we, we talked a lot about this morning. And the results that come out of that is the, the quantify the performance of these management procedures for each of these operating models. The, real, the results so we can see how likely uh, each of these management procedures is likely to work, or how well it's likely to work under the conditions of each of these operating models. And then the action at the end of that is the selection of a management procedure. From this list of candidate management procedures, the group can pick one and say, we're gonna pick this management approach because this is the one that's most likely to get us what we want. It's most robust to uncertainty. It's most, it's gonna keep the most people the most happy. So the key difference here is this entire process is a stakeholder driven process. Um, the only part that sort of is, is the closed loop simulation and evaluation is where we go off, put all these numbers into our calculator, runs the calculations and spits out the answers again. Uh, but the rest of it, all the pieces that go into that is, is driven by, by this, by the group. And so there's four areas really where, where the stakeholder involves collaboration with their, with their stakeholder group. One is to develop operating models, develop the candidate management plans, determine the evaluation criteria, the performance metrics, and then to do their final evaluation, to interpret the results. And so I'm gonna go through each of these four um, pieces, these four components with an example uh, using the GAG grouper and the red snapper, uh, and just to demonstrate what that process could can look like. Uh, but like I've said before, it's just a demonstration of a starting point. So don't worry too much about any, uh, you know, there's no results here, this is mainly just made up. So we start with the operating models. Operating model, we've talked about a lot about them this, this morning, but just in summary, it's a plausible description of the properties of a fishery system. So it describes the fish stock, the biology of the, of the population, and also the fishing activities, the exploitation that's, that's, uh, that stock is subject to. So a model, an operating model, looks something like this. We could have it for a species, and the stock component of that model uh, describes the biology, the spatial distribution, the movement, all the, all the things that, that relate to the, the biology of that, that fish species. And then the exploitation is models uh, or descriptions of the characteristics of the different fishing fleets that 
um, catch that stock. So there could be many different fishing fleets with different properties, um, different gear types. Maybe they fish with different amounts of uh, seasonal uh, effort patterns. Maybe there's different spatial uh, distribution or targeting. Some fleets may target one species over another. All that gets captured together, uh, at least one, one uh, set of assumptions or one description of, of the fishery is captured into one operating model. For a multi-species fishery like this one, we do the same thing. We build another model for the second stock. So here, the gag grouper, all the same pieces of information go into building an operating model for that <coughs> species. But of course, like we've spoke about, the complicating factor is there's interactions. These things aren't independent. So there's spatial overlap of the species. There might be preferential targeting. Uh, the real question we need to get at is how will manage it regulations for one stock impact the other? Um, and so that's that's the complexity of when you start doing a multi-species MSC. It's no longer, you need to consider that the management actions on one stock are gonna impact or potentially impact other stocks. And so this is where the uncertainties come in with multiple operating models. So you can have uncertainties in the stock characteristics and in the fleet characteristics. So for the stock, there might be uncertainty in the biological parameters, uh, in the spatial distribution, the abundance, the discard mortality, anything related to the, the stock that's uncertain or, or there's multiple uh, plausible hypotheses can get captured in, a, in a, a set of alternative operating models. And the same thing goes for different fleet, characterizing the fishing fleets that target those stocks. There may be alternative uh, explanations or hypotheses by how those fleet operates, operate. And so then we'd capture those uncertainties in, in multiple operating models. And for example, model number two may have different assumptions about the stock abundance or maybe driven from some different data. Model number three may have a spatial, different spatial distribution of these species and so on. And of course, the, the models don't only only have one factor. There could be there could be a model number two could be a number of these different things combined. But the point is each of these operating models is an hypothesis about the dynamics of the fishery. And so we're no longer worried about which one of these is true, and which one of these is false. We would just want to have as many of these that can that we that characterize the uncertainty in a, in a fishery. And and we need to have data to be able to you know, to be able to develop these models. So it's like, they can be based on something empirical, um, but it removes that issue, that big hurdle in an assessment where all the focus is trying to get on the right model. In this case, if there's a model that's plausible and, and people consider, well, it could be true, it becomes another model, becomes another operated model. So how do we build those operating models? So here we've got an example, Tom mentioned the, before, the, the easy way to do it is to import assessments because an assessment already is an operating model in the sense that it has or has all the properties of it that we need for an operating model. It estimates the, the biology of the stock and the characteristics of all the different fleets that target that stock. And so the simplest way is to take, which is what I've done here, is take these assessments, CDAR 73 and CDAR 71, the recent assessment for these two species, and use them as an operating model. So in this case, I'm calling that model number one. And, and the numbering of the models does mean anything in terms of order of importance. It's just, I'm just gonna start with this because it's the simplest one to do it. <clears throat> so these two pieces of information from the stock assessments go into the model, the operating model, and we simulate the historical fishery. And in this case, you can see on the top, the labels are very small on the plots, but the top showing the, the spawning biomass from the beginning of the fishery to the when the assessment was conducted in 2019, I think, uh, or 20. Uh, and the bottom shows the landings and the discards as estimated by the assessment model. In this case, these plots are showing exactly what came out of the assessment because the operating model is just based on that assessment. But model number two may use different data sources uh, or may use different assumptions either in that assessment or a different model. Uh, we need some process of going from the data, the raw data to a, to a description of the fishery, but that can come, that can be with different data or with different models. And there's lots of different ways we can do that. And it's something we need to talk about. Uh, and that, that will feed into model number two, again, a different version for number, model number three and so on. And then in those cases, each of those models will have a different uh, characterization of the fishery, potentially at least, different um, estimates of the predicted spawning biomass over time on the plot and different predictions of the, the catches and discards perhaps. And so the, once we've gone through that process, 
uh, and it is an iterative process, we will start with building one or a couple of operandals and, and it's usually a process where we start presenting some results, people see some things in the models they don't like or they consider other alternatives and, and we go around and you know another round and develop more models. Um, but at some point we have a group of operating models and 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 these are the, the, what Tom referred to as before as that sort of a reference operating models that we, we do the analysis on. So the questions for the, the group to consider for the operating models part of things, we've talked about a bit already, it's which stocks to include, what information is available to, to be able to build these operating models, what are the interactions between these stocks, we talked about that a bit this morning, and of course what are the key uncertainties, what is what is going to be the difference in these different operating models? Um, we can start, with, for example, with the with the assessment. We can just build, like I've done there, build a model number one. How, what what would be different in model number two? What's the key uncertainty that would change to produce a second operating model, and so on? So the second part of the process is the management policy or the management procedures. And so this is the process where we go from the data to a management decision. So in that box is a management procedure, and it's just data goes in, really specifies what data are going in and how those data are processed, from the raw data that's collected to, to some sort of data that can be used in, in, a, in a model. And then the rules, it's the core part of management procedure is the management rules. And they are a set of rules that convert that data to management advice. And that could be static, it could be set a size limit or set this spatial closure or some combination, or it could be adaptive. Uh, in many cases, they're adaptive. They take the data and they update the management advice based on the signal in that data. And then the, manage, the output of that is just the management advice. Whatever those rules may say, increase the TAC or change this or change that, that's what gets spit out of the uh, management procedure. So how's this different to a traditional approach? Well, an assessment, you know, an assessment can be a management procedure, but it's not always a management procedure. And management procedures can include an assessment or they can be something much simpler. But there are three ways that a management procedure is different from a traditional stock assessment approach. The first is that an MP is reproducible. And that means when you put the same data in the top, the same advice is going to come out the bottom every single time. So if you have different people, you're always going to get the same result because it's, it's just a set of hard-coded rules that say that process the data. There's no people in, inside there making decisions. The second part is that it's agreed upon. Once you've got a management procedure that's been coded up and agreed, it's been agreed upon, this is a set of rules. So once the data goes in, it gets processed according to those rules. There isn't any changes to the, the way that data is handled inside the MP. It's, it's hard-coded and it's agreed upon. And the third part is what we're doing here, is, is simulation testing. And that means we have some confidence that this management procedure will achieve the objectives that we're trying to achieve. Um, and that's not always the case. You can, you can do the first two parts, you can build a, a procedure like an assessment or something like that, it's reproducible and agreed upon. But if you don't simulation test it, then you've got no reason or no evidence to suggest that this approach will do what you want it to do. So I've got a couple of examples of management procedures. Start with a really simple one. Here we can have data that going in is uh, data is just to collect the catch per unit effort data from the fishery and then standardize that into an index of abundance. And then the rules to process that data are very simple. It just says if this if this index of abundance is above some target level, which you specify, then if it's above that, increase the catch limit by 10%. And if it's below the limit uh, limit level, then decrease it by catch by 10%. And if it's in between, just leave the, the TAC the same. That's the rules. And then the management advice is just to implement that catch limit every three years. Every three years, the data will be put into the MP. It will just very simply you could do this, you know, on a bit of paper and say if it's above the, the target, increase the catch. If it's below the limit, decrease the catch. Otherwise, leave it the same. It's it's very simple, but it's a perfectly acceptable management procedure and this sort of management procedure like this are applied in, in some fisheries. How well it would work will depend a lot on the fishery. It can get more complicated than that, uh, especially if you have multiple uh, gears or multiple um, sectors in a, in a fishery. So here's a more general example with commercial and recreational. 
you can monitor some 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 data streams, catch rates, size composition, it could be a bunch of different things, and then do the same uh, approach, but you can develop different rules for either commercial or recreational or any any different fleet structure that you may have and set independent rules for them uh, within the management procedure. And then the again the management outcome is just to implement those rules for the different sectors of the fishery at their set management interval. And then you can do the same thing when you have multiple species. You can you get the same, you know, you have multiple data is coming into the management procedure from multiple different species. It's processed in whatever way the management procedure is prescribed and it can set rules for the individual fleets and the individual uh, fish stocks within, within that fishery. And so the management controls that are within, within this management procedure can be any combination of a spatial closure, seasonal closure, size limit, bag limit, effort limits. We've talked about you know, all the different options this morning, but the, every management procedure uh, is, is one proposal of a set of either a set or, or, or you know, one or more of these uh, management controls for one or more of these fleets. Uh, and each different idea is another management procedure. And so at the end of this, we'll have um, a list of candidate management procedures, ideas, proposals for ways of managing this fishery that can be as simple or as complicated as, as we wish. And these are developed from, from the stakeholder group. Each management procedure will be potentially different data and different rules of how to turn that data into management advice. So the questions to consider for this part is what data can we can be used to inform management? What are the feasible management options? Different gear types, perhaps, or different stocks. Uh, what what can we feasibly implement in this in the fishery? And then, what's the management update cycle? And and all of these can have you know, different answers because each each uh, like for example, management update cycle, the the MSC process can look at what the value of having a, sh a shorter interval in a management uh, cycle can be. So you can update the, the management regulations every every year or every three years or every five years, for example, and you can see what the trade-offs are with that. You get obviously more stability if, if, if there's fewer changes, but it may not be as responsive. Um, and so these are all different alternatives that we can consider in different management procedures. The next part is the closed loop evaluation. Tom spent a bit of time that this morning, but I'll just give you a quick example of what that could look like for the for one operating model. So let's take for example our model number one, which we which we took from the assessment, we built from the assessments. The first part of this process is to simulate the fishery. So like on the bottom plot there is is the the, the biomass of those two sto stocks that's generated inside that manager strategy evaluation framework. In this case, it's just exactly the same as the predicted from the assessment because that's what the operating model is built upon. We have an operating model. Now we need a management procedure that we want to evaluate. And so here um, we've got a management procedure that's going to set rules for these two stocks and it's got a five year management cycle. And the management procedure could be anything. We don't even need to worry about right now what it, what, what it is. Um, it could be a size limit um, that gets a change over time, seasonal closure, any of those things. So the process begins where we take the data from the fishery that's available right now and apply that management procedure to the data. Put the data in and the management recommendation will come out and it will say, do this or do that. Then we implement that, it can be an implementation module like, like that Tom mentioned this morning. And that means um, it looks at the, the enforcement of those management regulations. Uh, and how, how well they're going to actually be followed in the fishery. Um, and so it can be, they can adjust, go from what the management recommendation that came out of the management procedure is to what's actually going to happen in the real, the real world. Adjust that and then that feeds back into the operating model and updates the, the dynamics in the operating model. and says, well, this is what happened. We changed the size of them. We, we opened this area. We increased the, the, the fishing season. And that's going to operate, uh, update the fishing dynamics that are in that operating model. And so now we're going to start a projection and you can see the model's been projected forward for five years. Models run for five years with those management actions in place, with 
from that have been prescribed by that management procedure. And then we simulate data from the model. Now we're in a projected world, we simulate data from our model and apply it back into the management procedure again in, five, in a simulated world in five years time. And so that's the closed in the loop part of the closed loop evaluation. It's gone around. And then we do another cycle and we do the same thing. We apply that management procedure to the simulated data. The management regulations will come out. They may be the same, they may have changed. Implement them back into the fishery, update the model, you see the, model, the populations move forward by five years. And again, another cycle and another cycle for a period of time, 20 years or so. Um, and then this is only just one projection, but of course, what, what we talked about this morning, the environmental conditions in the population are uncertain and, uh, and going to be different in the future. And so what we do is we run another simulation. Everything's identical in the historical period. And it's the same management procedure applying the same rules, but this run now has just got different environmental conditions in the model. And so this can be driven by, this can be recruitment, different recruitment going to the fishery driven by uh, different, uh, for example, oceanographic conditions. You may have a, a poor recruitment year or a really great uh, recruitment. It's, it's, it's um, random variability is added to the model and the properties of that random variability are characterized in the operating model based on, on the data we observed in the past. And then we had another simulation and another and another until we've done it, done enough simulations that can capture all that random variation, that uncertainty into the future. And an, once we've got enough to be able to have a stable distribution, we can describe that like I've got here with the median line, the solid, and the, cloud, and the shaded lines show that the percentiles of that distribution. And so once we have enough simulations, we can we can characterize the the, the uh, performance of these managed procedures. But we do the same thing now for management procedure number two. This gives me a different set of rules. And now you can see the same process was followed, but the population behaved differently, responded differently. Same for management procedure number three and so on. We do this process for all the management procedures that we've developed. <clears throat> so at the end of this process, we have something like this. We've got the results the historical period is the same for all of them, but the projections with the shaded part are different. And the only difference between them is the management procedure. Everything's identical in those models. They've all had the same random variability in environmental conditions in the future, but the only difference is the management set of rules that were applied. And so the difference in performance is that you're seeing, the difference in the, the stock projections is due to the way these rules work, how well these rules worked for this fishery. So the question then is how do we rank these management procedures, which have good performance, which have bad performance? And to do that, we develop evaluation criteria. And evaluation criteria are just things that we care about. How do we define good management outcomes? How do we define bad management outcomes? If we looked at projection plots like that, how do we, what metrics do we use to say that's a bad outcome, that's a good outcome? And so we call these performance metrics. And these are quantitative measures of management outcomes that we want to achieve or perhaps avoid. They're generally determined by stakeholders. Some are required by law to ensure, for example, sustainability of the resource. And they may differ between stakeholders. Different stakeholder groups may have different um, management outcomes that they're focused on that they'd like to achieve. And so the management strategy evaluation is used to evaluate those trade-offs among those management procedures and try and find a set of rules that can achieve, best achieve the desired management outcomes across all the different uh, stakeholder groups. So I've got a very simple example here to show how we go from those management procedure results, the results of the MSE to selecting, to choosing a management procedure, just choosing a set of rules. So for example, you might say, in order to be considered acceptable for management, a management procedure must demonstrate biological sustainability. It must have, for example, a 90% probability that the stock remains above some limit reference point. If it, if it gets, 
if it's less than 90% probability of being above a limit reference point, we think it's too risky and, and it can't be as, um, considered for management. We may be concerned about stability. We want to say we want to have no more than a 15% change in catch or in effort limits between management cycles. We, want, we don't want to have large changes in, in management regulations between management cycles because it's too disruptive. And then we might say, while satisfying those two, we want to have the highest catch that we can. We want to get the most catch out of the fishery. And we can care about other things as well. For example, catch composition. We may want to have a performance metrics that looks at the probability of catching trophy-sized fish. We want to say, we want the population to be in such a state that there's a good chance that we can catch big fish. It may be something that you care about. And there's lots of other things that can be considered, the fraction of the, the catch that has to be discarded, the length of the fishing season, anything that's important that you can that would like to evaluate, uh, we'll use to um, determine the performance of a management procedure goes into this list. These are things that we think are important. You want to try and maximise. And so the key points to consider for performance metrics is that they must be defined quantitatively. So we need to have numbers that are associated with each one of these. So for example, a limit reference point may be defined as half of BMSY, so it's used in some places. Uh, but if we talk about a limit or a target reference point, we need to define that in some way, some way that it can be measured within the model. Many metrics, many performance metrics require associated prob uh, probabilities. So we, because there's going to be uncertainty in that, we need to say something like, we want to have at least 90% probability of achieving this, um, or at least 50% probability or something like that. So, so that we've got a way of saying there's some probability of achieving this, but there's, there's no, uh, there's going to be uncertainty. We always like to frame performance metrics in a way so that high values mean better performance. Um, and so for things like stability, we, we look at the probability that the, the stability is less than something. So a higher probability is a good value, um, not high variability is, is a bad thing. So we try and frame them all so that the numbers, they're all the same. So high numbers are good, but low numbers are bad. And you can include any number of uh, performance metrics in an MSC process. Uh, and, but we, we recommend trying to limit it to between four and six or something at the end. But I think it's worth getting down all the ideas that we can, um, that the group comes up with, and then perhaps trying to refine that to a smaller number. The reason why you don't want to have too many performance metrics in the process, because it can make choosing, making the decision really difficult when you've got to evaluate it against 12 different performance metrics. Um, and so it is a good idea to try and limit, limit it. Tom? Just one note about that is that there's another reason why you might want to go for a smaller number. <clears throat> that is because we typically find that they're all really correlated past about four. So you can include in a big table 30 different views on what good performance is, but actually those differences are very well characterized by just four or five. So the point is, there's another reason why you want to keep it simple, is it because it, it usually can be characterized that way pretty easily. One of the problems we have here is we have multiple species. So unlike a single uh, species assessment, like for, for, for bluefin tuna, we have an east and a west stock, right? And so all of our metrics are multiplied out by the number of species potentially. So it's going to take some careful thought here to do that. But you'll find that you can you can have a big table with lots of things to look at, but really a smaller number characterize those differences. It'll be up to us to show you that, but um, there's no reason why you can't report a lot. So how do we calculate the performance of these? You know, we've got a set of performance metrics now. How do we calculate the performance? How do we actually use these, these performance metrics to choose among these management procedures? So again, I've got a very simple example. Let's say our performance metrics, these were our performance metrics. We want to have at least a 50% probability the stock is above a target level. And so here's our projection from a management procedure number one. The red and blue uh, dashed lines are the target level for, for these two stocks, respectively. Um, I think these are based on the assessment, but don't worry too much about the, the actual numbers. It's, it's all the performance. I intentionally made these 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 management procedures 
um, perform this way so I can prove the point rather than these aren't projections for this fish stock. So in this case, both the stocks, you can see the projection for both stocks for the management procedure number one are well below the target levels for those two stocks. So there's a low probability, well less than 50%. Management procedure number two, oh sorry, number three, has greater than 50% probability of being at that target level for those two stocks. The median line, the, the, the thick um, line in the middle of, those platter, uh, of that distribution is above the dashed line for each of those stocks. So it meets our performance metric. And we may, a second performance metrics may just be to maximize overall catch. So we want to get at least 50% probability of being above those dashed lines, and we want to maximize overall catch. And so if you do projections uh, of the catch, shown there on the right hand side, it's just showing the projection period from 2020 onwards, uh, the projected catches that are associated with these two management procedures. And you can see that management procedure number one has a lower probability of the stock reaching the target level and a lower average yield. And number three is a better option uh, because it has both, it, it meets performance metric number one, it has a greater than 50% probability and it has higher catches. So in this case, the, the conclusion would be really simple. You reject management procedures number one, it's too risky for one and it gets low catches and you just you consider management procedure number three because it achieves the sustainability metric that you were, that you were after and it gets higher catches. So to summarise calculating performance, we can form this analysis for all the candidate management procedures across all the different operating models. We eliminate any management procedures that fail to meet any mandatory performance criteria. So any, usually related to sustainability, but could be other things. If they fail to meet the minimum performance criteria, we just, we just can't consider that for management. And then you examine the trade-offs among the remaining management procedures. Some management approaches may result in, for example, larger or greater catch, average catch, but it may come with more variability. So over the long term, you get higher catches, but it's going to come at the cost of greater variability. Uh, other management procedures may have the reverse. And that's a trade-off that needs to be considered. And then from the, those results, we can identify the managed procedures that perform the best or have the most acceptable trade-offs across the operating models. And so the action then is the last part of this process. The stakeholders evaluate those trade-offs amongst the managed procedures. You go through the elimination process first, and then you evaluate that trade-off am among the uh, remaining. And it's not always a clear answer. There's not always a single best one. Sometimes a management approach will achieve you know, more of this and less of that, and, and other management procedures will achieve the reverse. So this is where a stakeholder group needs to weigh up those, those trade-offs amongst themselves and decide on what's the approach that's going to make the most people the most happy. And then there's a selection from that. As a result, you can select a management procedure. We're going to choose this management approach because it seems to do the best job at keeping, uh, achieving our, our, our goals. And that manager procedure is adopted for managing the fishery. And so, in, in principle, then the, the manager of the fishery for at least the, the next few management cycles is just collecting the data as you specified that manager procedure, run the data through the manager pr procedure, which can be can be quite simple if there's a set of rules. Whatever the manager procedure what recommendation it generates, that gets implemented into the fishery, and you continue the process. All the decisions, all the hard work have been made up front, and now it's just a matter of implementing that approach. But there is some work that still needs to be done. In particular, monitoring the fishery to detect unexpected changes in the stock dynamics. And so the simulations will, say, will show us how well these uh, management procedures are likely expected to work and what the fishery is expected to look like under those conditions. But it's still useful to monitor the fishery to see if things have radically changed for one reason or another. And if for some reason we start getting observations from the fishery that are completely different to what was expected from the management um, evaluation, that would be an indication that you need to revisit the fishery because the management procedure may not be working the way they expected. Maybe something's changed dramatically in the fishery that wasn't in, in, uh, included in, the, in those operating models. Uh, and this is termed exceptional circumstances. And we can talk more about this later on. But the idea is once you've got this process of adopting a managed procedure, it's it's been um, 
people have used an analogy of, a, of autopilot in a plane. You know, you've got the rules, got the destination, and you've got the, the, the route that's going to get you there. And so the management procedure, you just follow that and it should get you there. But you still want to monitor things to look out the window to make sure it's, you know, getting, it's going in the right direction. Okay, so I'm just going to just review the, just recap basically those five different parts of the process. Operating models, the stakeholders get together and develop alternative plausible descriptions of the fishery dynamics. The key points to consider here are the stocks to include the key uncertainties in those descriptions of the fishery dynamics, the method and the data for generating those alternative operating models, um, and the interactions between the stocks and the management. Spatial distribution, for, for example, is going to be quite an important one in this case. Second part of the process is develop management procedures. Again, the stakeholder groups get together and propose different candidate management procedures. The key points to consider here are the rules for converting data into management actions and what are feasible management actions for the, by, by stock and gear type. You can certainly evaluate the, the value of uh, management approaches that may not be feasible. The, the, the results can tell you like, well, if you could do this, uh, we did this a lot in California, for example, where they weren't able to set catch limits, but we could use the MSC to say, well, what if we could set catch limits? Is there any value in doing that? But it's important and useful, I think, to distinguish between things that can be implemented right now and things that you want to investigate the value of for potentially doing, but it's not currently possible. And with management procedures, there's no good or bad ideas. You can't predict the performance of a management procedure just from looking at it. You have to do this closed loop evaluation because every fishery is different. It comes down to the operating model, the fishery, like the, the characteristics of the fish stock, how the fishing fleet interacts with that stock, how it's implemented in the fishery. And so some rules can work really great in one place and terribly somewhere else because in, in every fishery, all those things are different. The third part is the closed loop evaluation. We just you know, all that information gets put into the into the, the calculator essentially and it calculates the performance. And then the key things to consider here is what we just spoke about, the management objectives. What are we trying to aim for? Performance metrics. What are these quantitative measures of those management objectives? And then we can evaluate those trade-offs. The results of this process to identify a management procedure. So the result of this process is not only the framework for doing this, but the goal is to, to select or at least identify a management approach that is best meets the objectives. So under all the conditions that we've considered in our operating models, this is the management procedure that's most likely to meet our goals. And then the action would be to adopt that management procedure and use it to determine management actions in the future based on the observed data that comes in. So that's it for the, the MSE process. I've just got, I think, one or two slides here, just to more sort of housekeeping stuff about the, the process. The closed loop evaluation gets, uh, we're proposing to do that in software, which Tom mentioned before, it's called Open MSC. It's software we developed for this purpose, for doing <clears throat> management strategy evaluation for a whole range of different fisheries. We, we started working on this um, because one of the reasons why MSC was was slow to adopt in many places was because every time somebody wanted to do a management strategy evaluation, they had to develop the whole operating model, the whole the, the calculator specifically for their fishery. And that's a, a lot of work to do that for every fishery. It takes a lot of time, a lot of expense. Uh, and then when it wanted to go do it somewhere else, they have to do that whole process again. And so we saw that happening a lot and started with our work in California I think around 2014 or so. We started developing, it was called something different then, but this idea of having, at least let's develop a, a standardized uh, framework, a calculator that can be used in many different places. So we don't need to keep re reinventing the wheel in every place. Uh, and so now we, we, it's called OpenMNC. It's called Open because it's open source. That means it's free to, to access. You can download the software from that website. It's also open source means that the code's all available. So you can see under the hood um, if you're interested all that stuff's online. <clears throat> you can see how it runs. You can download it onto your machine, change it, do whatever you like with it. The help documentation is all available on openmsc.com. And that's the software that we're intending to use to do the closed loop evaluation part of this.
for this particular project, all the all the, the code, the actual the analyses that are specific to this project are also available on online and under this link here. Um, I think at the moment it's a private um, repository, so you need you need to have um, permission to access it. The reason we've done that is just so that it's not available to the entire public. But I think if you contact Chip, it can just add you to it, or I can do it, um, and then you can see all the, all the code um, and everything that's going on in this project will be on that on that place in that place. Um, but maybe more user friendly, more easy easy to access is the the website that Chip mentioned earlier, uh, and that's based on that same. It's, it actually store all the information that website's stored in that on that code repository at the top, uh, and that's just what we. Um, it's available on that link there, and that's where we intend to put all the information that's related to this project on that page. So all the resources, papers, links to other projects will go on there. We have a thing called a a, a um, specific trial specifications document. Uh, at the moment, it's, there's a link there, but it's empty. The idea is that we document this entire process. Every decision that gets made is a living document. It keeps getting updated. <clears throat> As we develop operating models, they'll be described in that place and say, this is operating model number one. It's been developed using this method with these data. This is operating model number two. And that will continue to be refined. And that's available to anyone to see and to comment upon uh, and, and um, as, as a record of the decisions that are made by this group. And, and the idea is at the end of that, at the end of this process, that document will describe the entire process from beginning to end. And, and that's it. So thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you, Adrian, very much. Uh, that presentation on the uh, multiple species management strategy evaluation and uh, no point I got out of it is that uh, multi-species, which is what we're always involved in, is a little more difficult with MSE. It is a bit more of a challenge and uh, will be a little more precedent setting in that uh, it hasn't been used as much for uh, Multi multi species. Um, from the AP, are there any questions for Adrian on uh, this example model he's given? David. Um, so, just for clarity, so when we say when you're constantly talking about like management policy and and the various management policies translate to what we do that could effectively be a regulation whether it's single hook whether it's size limitations whatever the case may be correct yes that's right it's it's any it, it's exactly it's any sort of management regulation from from gear type to special closures or anything in between yeah. so my question goes back to something that a couple of us have already asked in some form or fashion if we haven't if i'm trying to think of the best way to say this but so if we haven't implemented some of these um, management policies slash regulations previously, how accurate or how do we know how accurate the output would be if some of these are implemented? And I don't know if I'm asking that correctly, but hopefully you get the gist of what I'm saying. Yeah, I think I think I do. Um, what we try to do is we, we condition, the operating models we condition on, on the available data. And then we also try and model uh, management procedures based on what we call status quo. So whatever's happening now and has happened in the past. And one way we can evaluate that is we we run our model back in time. We start from a, a period of, in the past and apply the management, you know, the current, the whatever rules were play, in place and make sure the model's predicting what actually happened. That makes sense? So we can see that that at least what's being applied now, the, the models are actually accurately reflecting the, the, the current situation in the fishery. And then we generally try when we do management procedures to include that approach going forward. So then you can compare any alternatives against the, the status quo. So you can see what is, you know, in some cases you can find that the status quo is doing a very good job, in which case the MSC, the whole process just gives you confidence that what's being done now is, is a, you know, a, a good approach. In other cases, there might be ways of showing how to change that to get improved input performance. Go ahead, Chip. Yeah, and just to build on that, so it's it's not likely that a, a single estimate would be used. It would be a range of values that would likely go in that, and that's how you have that cloud of information, uh, and then the median value is what would come out as you're 
your final impact potentially. Any other questions for Adrian? Yes, Tony. Yes, I, I was right along the same as David. Um, these variables are using past and present management uh, methods. Do we apply? Have need to apply others that may be on our minds, or it's obviously not computer generated. <clears throat> So the management methods, yes. no. So they, the idea of for those that the alternatives that have come from this group, um, and so they can be things that have been done in the past, things that have been done elsewhere. Maybe an idea that you would like to see but it hasn't been done. It can, it can be any of those things, but they're not generated. So this group, group and the council, we both put in our new ideas, fresher, better, whatever, and then apply them to what's and let it give us the cloud. Exactly. And so and so the idea is, if I just go back to those plots. Um, like these plots showing the, showing their performance, uh, I had a bunch of them like that. Um, all the ideas we can go into it, and at the beginning when someone proposes a new idea, like well, let's manage it this way, manage, manage it that way. No one would know. I mean, everyone believes it's going to be a good idea, but no one's going to know whether it is or not, right? Um, and we certainly can't predict it either. Uh, and, and definitely, this is only showing those performance for one operating model, but it may be under a different set of circumstances something doesn't perform as well. And so so that's what the idea of the results will show you. It will show you how well is this idea going to work and under what conditions will it work and on what conditions is it likely to fail. Uh, and if you can find something that's likely to work under a wide range of conditions. So for example, size limits are often, other than the implementation issue, the big thing with size limits is implementation and discards of. But if you ignore that for a second, you can, you can get really robust results from a size limit. Um, because it doesn't matter how little you know about the fishery, if you just know the size of maturity and set a size limit above it and don't catch fish below it, you don't need to have any data really, and you can get really good performance. Of course, the real world is much more complicated than that, but the MSC will show you, the idea is to show you the difference in performance. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead, Jimmy. Yeah, Jimmy Hall, thank you. Um, so at the end of the process, when we get an MP, um, and I don't know if you should answer this or Chip. Um, so does our current SSC have to approve this as the best information available for management or do they get to tinker with it in any way? Is, are they involved in this before the council can act on this information? Yeah, the SSC is gonna be the review body. Um, and so we're, we're gonna have to figure out how to work this through the system. I know NIMS is working on methods on how to address this through the current system. Can we use an MSE and use that to develop an ABC or is the ABC gonna be coming from a single stock assessment? So that type of stuff is gonna be worked out in the management realm upcoming um, and they're getting guidance on that right now. Um, but we are looking at a management uh, strategy evaluation for the dolphin fishery that does not have a stock assessment. And so that, that could be developing so ACLs from that maybe not ABCs, but maybe ACLs. We'll see. And um, yeah, it, it's just uncertain on how this is gonna work in the management system, but we think it could be a much more, uh, a, a much better way of trying to get different catch levels and more uh, quickly adjust catch levels to what's being observed in the fishery. Look, Looking to my left, was there anybody? David, did you want to come back in? No, uh, Tony kind of answered, or yeah, Tony Tony hit it, what I was asking. All right, thank you. It's Cameron. Yeah, Cameron Sebastian. So going back to what you were saying about uh, maturity and things of that nature. So you could run a, you could run a test on, this is just absolutely throwing it out there. So if you, if we said, hey, the most productive species for gag is anything over 35 inches and we came back and you ran your schematics on, hey, this is what this would look like if no one kept or no one kept gags over 35 inches that could factor into the overall uh, stock. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so that's that's a, a great example of a, like, of a management procedure. You might say, well, we want to know what would happen if we had a, a minimum size limit at this size or a maximum size limit, you couldn't keep it above this, and we can evaluate that. And then, of course, one of the uncertainties will be what happens to the fish that are below the minimum and above the maximum. Like, are they going to be caught and discarded? And if they do, or they're going to die? 
you know, these are, these are all uncertainties which will affect the performance. But that's that's a, an, a great idea, like a, a, a example of a of a management procedure that can be tested, a size limit for one stock or for multiple stocks. Go ahead, Cameron. Continue on. Yeah, I would, I would like just you know, so I mean, a, a tool like this. I think it'd be exceedingly useful, especially when, I mean, there's this stuff back and forth between rod and reel and spear fishermen and da 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 da, da you know, and, and all this dancing going along. And, you know, if you had something that's, you know, the scientists say, hey, this size fish produces the most offspring and spawns the most. And yet, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm a spear fisherman, don't get me wrong. And, you know, we say, hey, this, this size fish can't be targeted by a certain group because we're taking the biggest the best fish off the market that 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 reproduce the most uh you know that's that could be a very very good tool to utilize thank you cameron any more questions uh so i want to thank uh tom and adrian i just would have a question for chip um with respect to the document that we were given to review, the AP discussion document, uh, it's stated these are things for us to think about before we get here. Is that truly what we wanted? Um, and are, are we finished with this? Are we completed? Or would you like, I, maybe, I don't want, wouldn't want to go too long, but maybe some bullet points on the questions you asked us to think about, or have we actually covered it sort of with the discussion we've had and all the questions that were asked. I'll leave that up to Adrian and Tom. I mean, I, I feel like you guys covered all kinds of information and it's definitely a good starting point. Yeah, my sense is that this is an initial meeting for you guys to just chew on it, basically. Um, and no more than that. And not really be asked to think more in a more detailed way than you already have. I think it's fine. We covered the points you wanted. We got excellent feedback. Um, and um, I, you know, from my perspective, I'm very encouraged. I think we're in a good spot. Um, we can worry about specifics another time when people have had a second bite at the ideas and maybe seen some more examples. But I think this is as, as good as I could have hoped for. I think this is great. Thanks everybody for their feedback. All right, thank you, Tom and Adrian, and thank you to the AP. This was a, a very good session, very interesting. So thank you very much. Our next item on the agenda is Amendment uh, 53, which will be covered by Ali uh, Iberly. And uh, I would just like to take a five minute break. Ali, you can set up and uh, we'll be back. So five minutes, but no later than 2.10. Well, I, I did want to say thank you to Tom and Adrian for that explanation of MSEs. I thought that was one of the most in-depth and most explain, uh, best explained MSE that I've seen, so thank you guys. Very good. Yeah.